Thank you. Um, right. Hi, as I said, my name is uh, Andrew Feeney. Um, I'm a linguist from Northumbria University. And I'm talking about today about the recent hypothesis that pragmatics, and um, possibly pragmatics alone, can account for unleashed expression. So I'm going to start with a very quick historical background to pragmatics in linguistics, and particularly in language evolution, which is essentially one of neglect. Um, if you are familiar with it, then, then I apologize if, it, if it, that is too familiar, but I'll be going through that quite quickly. I'll then look at the proposals that have been made to, to, to rectify this, if you like. Um, and the strong end of these claims is that pragmatics is both necessary and sufficient for the unbounded creativity of, of language as we have it today. I think this is mistaken. I'll identify what I think is the central problem in this hypothesis. And it's to do with how and when a pragmatic capacity evolved in our um, precursor species. And very quickly at the end, I'll present a solution to the problem and the notion that pragmatic capacity is actually grounded in general cooperation, which emerged in our species anywhere up to about 2 million years ago, a little bit more recent than that. And that only in the last 500,000 years has there been further cognitive developments um, in either early human or late, late, the late hominins, um, that accounted for um, our unleashed expression. Okay, quick prologue. When I'm talking about language, well, people, particularly at, at um, Proto-Lang and Evolang, often talk about language in very different ways. At the one end of a continuum, you get people who focus on very narrow um, syntactic computations. And at the other end, you get people who talk about um, all aspects of the engagement in communicative acts, including gestures and performance and all sorts of things. My notion of language that I'm using here is the, is the way language is often talked about in the pragmatic literature um, these days. And it's a communicative propositional sentence or a particle um, that's, that's engaged in, in, in a communicative act. Okay. So language traditionally um, has focused on Obviously, the sounds of language, this is structuralist and pre-structuralists, so the phonology, how those sounds combine into meaningful units, the morphology, how those units can themselves be combined into longer units, the syntax, um, and what the propositional content, the meaning that's encoded within those units, and that's the, the study under semantics. Pragmatics as a term has only been around less than 100 years. Um, and as Bahalel points out in 1971, for much of that time, it was considered to be a wastebasket. The things that, that didn't neatly fit into accounts of language or didn't neatly fit into phonology, morphology, and so on, well, well that's pragmatics, we'll leave that aside. It's only really with Grice in the second half of the last century um, and the notice of implicature that, that pragmatics becomes um, a much more uh, significant part of, of linguistics and of language study. So for Grice, language was not just a code. For Grice, it definitely was partly a code. But for Grice, the total propositional content of any utterance is both what is said, what's actually encoded in the language, the semantics, but also what is implicated, and that's the pragmatics. And very often what is implicated can be the most significant, the most salient aspect that someone tries to, to communicate to their interlocutor. Uh, following Grice, pragmatics quickly became established as a central part of linguistics. Levinson published his famous textbook in 1983. And also in the 80s, Berber and Wilson began the research project that, that became relevance theory, which is, which is so big and so important today. Um, quickly, uh, what do we mean by the non-codified meaning of an utterance as opposed to the codified aspect? Well, we've got two parts of some utterances. Let's hear one, two. In the first one, we have the hearer responding, saying, "I don't speak to liars." And okay, that's a prop that has propositional content. It, it has truth conditions. It's true if and only if it, I don't speak to liars, or people that I know to be liars. But if you put that into um, a communicative exchange, such as in the response to "Did you speak to Charles?", then clearly the most salient aspect that I'm trying to communicate is that I think Charles is a liar but Charles clearly isn't encoded anywhere in my actual utterance. Um, similarly, in the second example, we've got here the hero responding with, yeah, whiskey. And it's very hard to say that that has any 
truth conditions, any propositional contents at all. And yet, in a communicative interaction, it can clearly communicate something very significant. I borrowed this example from Jack and Dorf, so apologies to him. So in response to, do you want a drink? Yeah, whiskey. OK, yes, I would like a drink of whiskey. Um, do you want anything from the shop? OK, a slightly different meaning. Is there anything in the cupboard? Yet yeah, another meaning. And even um, a comment like, Harriet's been drinking again, and they say, yeah, whiskey. Well, that means something utterly different to the first three responses. And again, it refers to the action of Harriet, who's nowhere encoded in my utterance there. So this is the, the, the non-codified, the, the pragmatic aspect of language. That is so important and so central to, to the use of language and communication. Um, your ability to understand these utterances, your ability to get at the correct meaning, and by correct I mean the meaning that I intend, is, just, is dependent upon two things, your willingness to cooperate. So when I speak, you think it's worthwhile paying attention to what I'm saying. By, by In the act of speaking, I'm ostensibly signaling that I have something to communicate and, and you respond to that in a cooperative way. And it just so happens that the way we think, our cognitive biases are both geared towards the most salient aspect, towards what we call a presumption of relevance. Um, it's just the way that, that the hominin brain has evolved. We, we both focus on the most relevant aspect of anything that could potentially be um, implicated through an utterance. Okay, so what about pragmatics in language evolution? Well, right from, from the rebirth, if you like, of language evolution studies around about the 1990s, you had Pinker and Bloom and Bickerton, these generativists. Um, they started off with a fairly narrow focus on the structural aspects of language. And over time, that focus actually got even more narrow, most famously with the House of Chomsky Fitch contribution to the discussion of language evolution. And generativists, whether they are saltationists who argue for a, a more or less instantaneous appearance of language, or traditional Darwinian gradualists like Pinker and Jackendorf, well, they're still focused essentially on these narrow structural aspects of language uh, to the neglect of pragmatics. So, for example, anybody who's looked, has had any familiarity with Chomsky's recent work, we're familiar with the minimalist program. And right in the middle here, we've got merge and internal merge or movement, possibly a little bit of merge after spell out, but spell out is just this operation that sends some instructions to interfaces, PF, phonetic form to interact with your sensory motor or your articulatory perceptual system, i.e. sounds, and LF, your instruction to the conceptual intentional system to interpret the sentence in a, in a certain way. So a lot of syntax, a little bit of interface with others, but nothing to do with pragmatics. And some of the gradualists like Jackanoff were very critical of this. Um, they call it syntactocentrism, said, it, well, this is just focused on syntax and not the other aspects of language. So Jackendorf proposes his parallel architecture. And OK, that includes phonology as well as conceptual um, structures operating in, parable, in, in parallel, each with the same degree of importance as the syntax, and then each of them are all interfacing. But again, that's as far as it goes. There, there's no... Um, pragmatic aspect to this at all. And if we actually look at Jackendorf's uh, notion of language evolution, um, well, we start with symbols, um, whether gestural or vocal, and gradually we get a concatenation of symbols, phonological combinatorial system, so it was vocal by this time, he claims, and um, a fixed symbol position, and this produces proto-language. Um, Sort of highlighted that because that's what we're here to talk about um, but nothing in there about pragmatics and then after that we get more syntax hierarchical phrase structure more abstract semantic encoding inflectional morphology and so on till we get modern language again no place there for pragmatics non-nativists have been um, less focused on narrow structures um, and all of these people are doing really important work. It's very interesting. Uh, so there was some early stuff on proto-language, which looked at the notion of holophrastic proto-language, which was then fractionated into smaller combinatorial units. Um, people have looked at the acquisition of morphosyntax and some of these iterative learning models. 
a lot of work being done on grammaticalization. Um, as I say, it's all valuable work, but again, it has nothing to do with, with pragmatics. Pragmatics seems to have been left out of not just linguistics and for quite recently, but language evolution in particular. Um, but that has changed. There has uh, recently there's become more of a focus uh, on pragmatics. But a lot of these early um, proposals to do with the pragmatics seek not just to central, not, not just to establish a role for pragmatics, but to centralize that role. In the name of one of these papers, it's pragmatics first. Um, it becomes the critical stage in language evolution. It becomes not just necessary, but necessary and sufficient for expression unleashed. And in order to do that, they have to account for the capacity for expression recognition of int intention and the presumption of relevance. So I recognize your intention to communicate and we're both able to focus on the most relevant aspect um, of what is being communicated. Okay, but that brings up an inevitable problem in where did this presumption of relevance, this cognitive bias that hominins have or humans have, uh, where did it come from? It's the, the, the usual problem when you're looking at communication language evolution as it has to co-evolve, if you like. It can't just evolve in one person and then later in somebody else. That makes no sense of it to do with interaction communication. Um, so was there something there all the time? Was there a proto-presumption of relevance, as, as one of these authors suggests. Well, the evidence for that is very, very slight. Um, they, if you look at captive apes, there's, there's very little indication um, that they are in any sense focused upon the, the, the intention or the relevance of anything that a conspecific or a human interlocutor is attempting to communicate. Um, some of these people have also made proposals that there was a deep homologue and perhaps equivalent to human capacity to swing from trees. But the human capacity to swing from trees is clearly vestigial and has a clear evolutionary origin. We used to live in rainforests. We used to swing from trees because it was useful. We can still do it a bit now because that's what that, that capacity is still left. It makes no sense to say there is a proto capacity lurking in other hominids, a, pro, um, a, a capacity for proto uh, presumption of relevance, um, you have to account for where, where that might have come from. Okay, what I think the most likely explanation is that um, this presumption of relevance um, emerged along with greater hominin cooperation, and Michael Tomasello in particular has written um, a lot on this. So if we look at hominins anywhere up to about 2 million years ago, um, probably Homo erectus, but depending on whether you're a lumper or a splitter, so maybe Homo ergaster or a similar species. Um, but there are lots of behavioral changes associated with, with this time period. We get the appearance of Acheulean hand axes, the first ever mode two tools um, produced by any species on earth. Um, then uniform found throughout the world. At the very least, there must have been a degree of emulation, if not, um, more specific learning as we understand it. There's some evidence of coordinated hunting and scavenging. There is quite a lot of evidence of the use of fire, certainly ad hoc hearths, but maybe even um, controlled fire for the cooking of food. That would help explain some of the body morphology changes to the, to the skull and the teeth and so forth. Um, and most significantly, there was the migration out of Africa. So Homo erectus, um, with their Acheulean hand axes, left Africa and in a remarkably short period of time um, colonized at least three continents with, with hugely different climates and um, environments. And none of these alone are guarantees of cooperation, but taken together, um, they do suggest um, a, a greater degree of cooperation amongst these hominins than has been seen certainly in any other of the higher animals in any of the primates. If this, is, if this is right, if there was greater cooperation, and perhaps there was also a proto-language, and I suggest that, that that probably is the case. Certainly the evolutionary adaptations for vocalizations begin very shortly after this. So as I've mentioned, the changes to 
the size and structure of the vocal tract to other aspects of the skull and the teeth and so forth. And these um, air sacs that are present in Homo erectus and present in modern day primates, um, but block the full range of vocalizations that humans make. Well, these air sacs disappear from the evolutionary record and are gone by the time of Homo herbigensis around about 500,000 years ago. So a, there is good evidence to suggest um, that this cooperative species began to um, communicate in some form of, of, of a proto-language. And that proto-language requires a recognition of intention and a focus on the most relevant aspect of what it is you're trying to communicate. But if these hominins were cooperative, if they had proto-language, well, what happened to that language? Because for the following million years, there was almost complete cultural stasis. There is this revolution of these behavioral um, modifications I've just discussed. And yet for the next million years, nothing equaling that seems to happen. And the famous architect J. Desmond Clark was recorded to have commented that if Homo erectus did have proto-language, then these ancient people were saying the same thing to each other over and over and over again for about a million years. Okay, and I suggest that's because a pragmatic presumption of relevance is necessary for language and is necessary for proto-language, but is not sufficient for an unleashed, for unleashed expression, for the unbounded creativity uh, that we see in modern language. Something else was needed, some further cognitive development in the species was necessary in order to punctuate this, this, this cultural equilibrium, obviously using Gould and Eldridge's term here. And something was needed to enable the assembly of um, modern human behaviors that we see in Africa, um, that discussed McBearty and Brooks and many others have, have discussed since then. So the big question is, what was that modification? Okay, and I'm gonna leave that as, as my conclusion here. And the best proposal um, that, I, that I've seen, that I discuss with people, um, is based on Herford's 2007 paper in Behavioral Brain Sciences, in which he posits the idea that propositional content is exacted from the ancient ability to subitize, this ancient ability to recognize small numbers and differentiate two, three, or four, maybe up to five. It's an ability we share with apes, with great apes, we share with macaques. There's even evidence to suggest it goes as far back in the evolutionary tree um, in, as in guppy fish. Um, so propositions that are uh, focused on, that are exacted on from, sorry, the ability to subitize consisting of a predicate with, okay, a single core argument of a subject, possibly a second core argument, in some cases three, but almost never four and never more than four core arguments um, in a proposition and nor in, in any linguistic um, predicate. And there's no a priori reason for that. We can all imagine complex predicates with five, six, seven or more arguments, but they don't exist. The only way we can conceptualize of that is by conceptually embedding simple propositions, recursively embedding simple propositions. Okay, so I suggest that that is the modification. It gave rise to a uniquely human form of reflective cognition in the literature on dual processing theory, this is referred to as, as type two cognition, um, reflexive pragmatic cognition. Um, there was an extension of the existing proto-language and it became the modern language that we know today. And the function of that language is to symbolically represent externally in sounds, the syntactic hierarchical recursive um, internal um, language of thought, if you like, with the very various other terms in the literature that people use. Okay, and that's my, my, my identification of the problem with pragmatics in linguistics language evolution, the current attempt to resolve that, the problem I see in it, and what I see is the solution to that problem. And I'll just finish there. Um, thank you very much.